We're Skyping with Dr. Rebecca Kaltman, a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer at George Washington Medical Faculty Associates, to discuss the medical aspects of Angelina Jolie's decision to have a preventative double mastectomy. Doctor, this all comes down to a gene that uh, increases the risk of breast and ovarian cancer. What, what is that gene? So BRCA1 and 2 are actually two genes that have been identified since 1990 as causing mutations in those genes cause an increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer. So it's actually, we all have BRCA1 and 2, they're normal genes. When they malfunction or are miscoded, that it can end up causing an increased risk of breast cancer. So how do we know that they're miscoded? So usually we get that from a family history. So most of the time these women present with a strong family history of breast or ovarian cancer or sometimes cancer in male relatives like prostate cancer um, that's highly prevalent in multiple uh, generations in the family. So it's, uh, there's a family history, but is there a test run to find well, out? Absolutely. So once we get a history of, a, uh, of cancer in the family or an individual is diagnosed with a breast cancer at a very young age, we suggest that they undergo genetic counseling and testing. And the testing is a blood test. Uh, and it usually takes about two to, two to four weeks for it to come back. And we get that information and then counsel them about the results. Are younger women more at risk? Yeah. So women who end up... Uh, Developing breast cancer because of one of these mutations not infrequently are diagnosed at a premenopausal age because they're coming into life with an already mutated gene. And these genes usually function as tumor suppressor genes. They actually help keep women from getting breast cancer and ovarian cancer and other types of cancer. So when one is malfunctioning, if the other copy of the gene becomes malfunctioning as well, that's when cancers can develop. Okay. So once this is discovered, at what point do you recommend... A decision be made? What I usually counsel women, especially when they get diagnosed with a mutation, is that they've had this since birth. Um, so we try to counsel them as much as possible not to make a rash decision because these are big decisions to make about lifelong risks and benefits and um, major types of uh, health decisions in general. So um, I usually talk talk them down, if you will, um, because if they have the mutation, they, there's a lot, obviously, in the press um, with women making decisions based on their mutation status that might not be right for uh, any one individual. So we have a long counseling session and subsequent follow-up sessions with them about what might be appropriate for them. Some women choose preventative surgery. Other women choose uh, a course of surveillance and medication to help reduce their risk rather than going to surgery. So it is a long and lengthy discussion, and it's not anything that women need to act on immediately. You mentioned surveillance. What alternatives do you have at GWMFA? So we're very fortunate here to have a, a team of breast specialists, both women in uh, radiology, uh, breast surgery, and medical oncology like myself, who focus on not only caring for women with breast cancer, but actually following women with, who are at high risk for developing breast cancer who may have one of these mutations. We have a wide array, array of screening uh, techniques available to us. Our radiology department is incredible and we have uh, novel imaging techniques beyond mammography and ultrasound and beyond uh, routine MRI imaging that we can offer uh, women who are at high risk. These include 3D ultrasound, which is something that I've seen personally pick up malignancies and cancers that were missed by even MRI, which is a very sensitive test. Um, we also have breast-specific gamma imaging, which is another modality to look at the functional uh, the functioning of the breast tissue and not just at the at the plain image. So we have a number of techniques that we can incorporate in addition to adding uh, a breast examination by a clinician, uh, educating patients on how to do their own breast examinations, as well as lifestyle changes that can help reduce their risk of developing breast cancer. So along with the gene, lifestyle plays a, plays a, a function here as well. Absolutely. While genetic mutations can certainly trump the risk um, that's posed by environmental or lifestyle factors, lifestyle factors are still important. So leading a healthy life by, you know, eating a well-balanced diet, by exercising regularly, maintaining an ideal body weight, um, those factors are very important in helping uh, stay healthy uh, from a general perspective, but also in reducing cancer risk. Specifically, uh, moderating alcohol use can also reduce that risk, and that's something that we also counsel women about who carry these mutations. We talked about reducing the risk. What are 
what do the risks become once uh, the double mastectomy takes place? Right. So the lifetime risk um, of a woman with a BRCA1 or 2 mutation is 60 to 80 um, percent. And the risk for ovarian cancer is also elevated. With a BRCA1 mutation, it's as high as 30 to 45 percent. So um, when we talk about doing implementing these measures like prophylactic surgery or preventative surgery, um, prophylactic mastectomy specifically will reduce the risk of developing breast cancer in these women by 95%. So it's a huge risk reduction. It's highly effective, obviously, but again, not the best decision for some women. Some women are very averse to having surgery for uh, preventative measures, and other women, it is absolutely the right decision, and it gets them away from having to do the surveillance and having to come in every six months for breast imaging. Well, what advice do you give someone who may be considering it now, especially since it's so much in the news with Angelina Jolie? I think coming to a center like GW, um, where they can get fully educated in all of their options is very important because we don't feel that there's any cookie cutter approach uh, that's appropriate for the situation. It's very important for them to meet with the surgeon, but also meet with the medical oncologist, the radiologist, to really get a sense of what their options are and then pick what suits them the best and what suits their lifestyle the best. Uh, what about reconstructive surgery? What part of the process is that? Right. So when a woman is contemplating having prophylactic mastectomy or preventative mastectomy, um, we usually have the patient meet with the breast surgeon, who is the surgeon who will actually remove the breast tissue. And that breast surgeon works with uh, plastic surgeons. And we have an amazing plastic surgery department here who works specifically on breast reconstruction. And there are many different options depending on the patient's body habitus um, and their own personal preference on what type of reconstruction they would like. So again, Again, it's another consultation, um, but it's usually uh, done in concert with the uh, regular surgery consultation. Well, what about the ovarian cancer aspect of this? Right. So that's an important piece not to ignore because uh, the ovarian cancer piece is, is uh, probably the more significant uh, risk to women, even though the, the actual n numerical risk is lower, 30 to 45 percent in a BRCA1 mutation carrier. But the issue with ovarian cancer is it's very hard to screen for. So we can't pick it up on uh, routine imaging. There's no blood test that routinely will pick it up easily. So those, um, those are major concerns in mutation carriers um, that we don't have a way to screen these women appropriately. So um, when we do diagnose somebody with a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, we counsel them about appropriate types of screening versus preventative surgery. And it kind of depends on where they are in life, their station in life. So if I diagnose a 25-year-old mutation carrier, um, you know, with a mutation who has, has not yet a par met a partner yet and they actually are interested in childbearing, obviously prophylactic oophorectomy or removal of the ovaries is not uh, an option we'll be considering up front. Um, so we usually just do surveillance. There is a blood test that's not perfect, but we can use to do screening. We make sure that they have pelvic examinations every six months by a, a specialist. Um, and we also make sure that they have a transvaginal ultrasound every six months to do uh, to screen as well. In patients who have completed childbearing and uh, are nearing menopause, we do counsel them about preventative surgery for their ovaries. Um, and that's usually done around age 40, um, sometimes a little later. Um, and that is the most effective way to reduce ovarian cancer risk. The added bonus in BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers by doing pre preventative surgery for the ovaries is that it will also reduce the risk of breast cancer in some women in, uh, by as much as 50% if they have their ovaries removed before menopause. So there's an added bonus. So in a woman who's premenopausal who has her ovaries removed let's say in their 40s, they not only get a 96% risk reduction in ovarian cancer risk, but also about a 50% risk reduction in breast cancer risk without even touching the breast. So without so, any operation, any, right. not a mastectomy or anything like that. Right. right. What do you think of Angelina Jolie's decision? It was the right thing for her. I will say that. Um, I would say, you know, most women who are faced with a lifetime risk of cancer of 60 to 80%, um, they will strongly consider the option that she chose. Um, having surgery to remove the breast, like I said, the risk reduction is 95%. It's a huge risk reduction. That brings your risk 
down below the risk of the general population, which is enormous. Uh, and for her and for her lifestyle, this worked. Um, I will say that a lot of women do choose that option who are carriers, but many women don't too. So I don't want uh, anyone out there to feel like that that's a necessity. If they find out that they're a carrier, that is not something that we push. It is a decision that they have to come to themselves if, it, if it's the right one. Dr. Rebecca Kaltman, thank you. Thank you.